CSIS 2430 is filmed before a live studio audience. So this is the only ch part of Chapter 3 we're going to cover, 3.1. And most people who take this class, 2430, also somewhere along the way will have taken or have currently taken, taking or will take 2420, data structures and algorithms, right? And so this, I, I don't want to rehash all that material because most of you will be exposed to it again in the future or already have and so forth, as I just mentioned. So we're going to do a brief sort of glance over the rough idea here. And then we're going to talk about a couple different specific algorithms and some of the reasons why we kind of care about thinking about that stuff from the perspective of discrete structures, okay? So, first of all, um, let's just look at kind of the, the big picture here we're going to talk about. We're just going to get an introduction to kind of what is an algorithm, which is stuff that you guys probably already know. Um, we're going to look at search algorithms and sorting algorithms and then what's known as a greedy algorithm. Now, I specifically will be talking about a search algorithm, or sorry, a sorting algorithm, which you guys do not use in 2420. I don't even think it's in the book. That's the bubble sort, okay? We're gonna be talking about that. And then we're gonna be talking about greedy algorithms because from what I can tell from the, those who cover 2420, don't spend a lot of time on greedy algorithms either. So I thought I could supplement the extra pieces there, all right? So let's look at a brief look at the history here, first of all. This, anybody want to take a, an attempt at pronouncing this name? I have no idea how to say it. Yeah, Koarizmi, Cor, something like that. First name, I'm not, that's not a first name. That's luckily actually like his third and fourth name. That's a really long name. He's from, uh, let me get my notes out for the details on this. But somewhere in the like ninth century, this guy was around. He's known as the father of, um, uh, algebra, right? He was the first person to sort of decide to treat algebra as its own separate discipline and sort of separate it out from the rest of the mathematics. And it, yeah, ninth century. Yeah. Um, and, and so he wrote a book about uh, Hindu numbers, numerals. And over time, this name here that we're seeing got kind of, you can see how it could blur into that algorithm, right? Can you see how that's sort of similar to the original name? And um, that sort of became known as rules for decimal math. Like that's what it was when you talked about rules for decimal math, you're talking about algorithm. That's that con that was the concept. And then somewhere around the 1700s, it evolved into this ish. And depending on who you ask and the sources you look at, there's a few little minor differences in the history. But by the, the, word, the word algorithm as we know it and the definition as we know it happened in the 20th century. But what do we know as an algorithm? The third bullet point there. Exactly that, a series of steps to accomplish a task. So over time, it, it first was having to do with just um, Hindu numerals and then it became sort of having to do with the rules of decimal math and eventually became this sort of computerized thing that we know it as today. And as you mentioned, it's a procedure for solving problems, okay? What kind of problems can we solve with, al with algorithms? Yeah, yes. You looked ahead? No, it's just the default example. Yeah, yeah, see? <laughs> you predicted the future. <clears throat> All right, so we are going to do this, and I know that at this level in your career, this is a little bit elementary. You guys know this, but I have a specific purpose for having you walk through this that we'll talk about in just a minute. So I'm, uh, I'm going to pause the video and everything, and I want you guys to, in your teams, bullet point out on the whiteboard the steps to make a peanut butter sandwich. I'm not, there's no correct answer here. It's just whatever your team feels. Yeah, I'll give you guys markers in a second. Okay, and I want to see how I want to split the teams up. Um, maybe if I could convince you two to just come over here, that would, that would just leave the teams the rest of the way there. All right. So uh, I'll give you markers in just a second, but go ahead, outline, just pseudocode or just English, just bullet points. I don't need to see any real code. Just something simple that I'd be able to look at it and read it and know what it is. All right. All right, we're back. And we're going to kind of talk through some of these that I see on the board here. So I'm going to open up a uh, notepad here. 
and let's start with let's start over there so we have obtain ingredients and then uh, get utensils what's the next thing way okay that's how you you, oh, layout. I thought it was yeah. way out. Okay. So it's like way. Yeah, I got you. Layout. Two, two pieces of bread. Yeah. Two pieces of. I'm gonna have typos and stuff. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. What's next? Deploy. De deploy desired, amount. desired amount of peanut butter. Okay. Deploy peanut butter. <laughs> nice. And then uh, you had specifics there with utensils on one side of one slice of bread. And what's the last thing say? Cover peanut butter with other slice. Okay, so let's just start with this one. We, we may do others. We'll see. Um, obtain ingredients and utensils. That should be good. Um, so let's take first of all this sandwich. Even forgetting about the details, this sandwich is totally different from one that I would make because I put peanut butter on both sides, like both pieces of bread. You know. And so you guys don't, which is totally fine. There's no wrong way here. You got to start going down a rabbit hole. Yeah, it was easier to write out yeah. instructions. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you've run into programming problem number one. Uh, when you get a complicated program, what do you do? Simplify. You, you, well, simplify. And in your case, you did simplify. But with that simplification did you meet the ultimate requirement of the, the program because i didn't give you one then you could argue yes you did but that's one that's a very common thing that will happen when you're writing a program and you're like oh this is going to take forever i don't want to do this this way and so i want to for the one of a better term take a shortcut right so Again, if, if, if I specifically said peanut butter on both sides, then, then I would argue you took a shortcut. But if, since I didn't say that, you didn't. But that's something to think about. When you get big projects, you really got to scope these things out and plan them out. Okay, so that's, that's problem number one that we can run into. Let's take a look at this. Obtain ingredients. That in and of itself is a whole other algorithm. Would you agree? Right? Because computers don't know what that mean means. Right now, if I said to you, um, if you wanted to borrow my car, and I said, uh, "Here, here's the keys. It's parked over there. Go, go for it." Right? I wouldn't have to tell you a whole lot of details. Maybe if I have two keys, one for the ignition, one for the door to get you in, I might have to tell you that. Or maybe I have some little weird, tricky thing about putting it in gear or something. But assuming there's nothing weird like that, I give you the keys, show you where the car is. You know how to unlock it. You know how to get in. You know how to drive it. No big deal. But somebody who's never seen a car, never heard of a car, don't know, doesn't know what they do, that's a whole different thing, right? I have to explain to them what to do with the key. I have to explain to them once they put the key in the hole what to do with that. Turn it. Then what? Grab the handle. And do I have to explain to them what grabbing the handle means? You know, take your left hand or right hand, push, put it out, reach, push the button, pull out, whatever. Once they get in the car, I have to explain to them what the ignition is, where to put the key, what to do with the key, what those two pedals do, right? The long skinny one and the short fat one. What do those two things do, right? And you have to explain all that. So there's a whole bunch more that goes into it that we don't even think about as humans. All we know is, yeah, drive a car, open it, get in and drive it. And we don't even really think about the open it and get in part. We just think about driving the car. So as a programmer, and I know you guys know this, but I just want to make sure we think about this for just a minute. As a programmer, we have to think of every possible scenario. And in fact, today in our PHP class, you missed an awesome opportunity to see this in action today. Uh, in our PHP class, we, we were walking through an idea here and we ran into several different snags that led us sort of down a little bit of a rabbit hole that we had to really think through to make sure we didn't overlook something. This is a very common thing that happens when you're writing code. So obtain ingredients. That could be a pretty huge algorithm. Get utensils, probably as big as you obtain ingredients. What kind of things would you have to think about, about obtaining ingredients? Imagine you're programming an actual robot to do this. <laughs> now, in this case, at least we, we have the ingredients exist, let's say, but you're right. What if they didn't even exist in the house, right? So you have to look for that. 
What else do we have to think about? We're going to tell what ingredients we want. We're going to tell specifically what ingredients. What are the ingredients? It's peanut butter and it's bread, right? Okay, where's the bread located? Where's the peanut butter located? Some people keep those things in the fridge. Some people don't. Okay? And so it has to know, it has to know where it's located if we're talking about a robot. We have to, it has to know which way it's looking, where to look in the kitchen, and so forth. But either way, once it gets there, we have to tell it, okay, reach out, grab the jar, put it on the counter, move over to the counter. So I, I know it's a little silly and, and mundane, but that's, this stuff can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. When it gets to obtain the ingredients, it has to open a door maybe because it's in the, the food pantry. Well, you've got to write code to do that, right? I mean, every, every algorithm could have a sub-algorithm, and that could have another sub, and so on down the line. And it can get crazy out of control. Now, granted... The main, like if you're, if we're talking Java here, your public static void main, you want it to look something like this. Pretty simple and straightforward. This is a function or a method that's going to be called, and then that's a method that's going to be called. And so you want to have to know, you need to know all the parameters that are going to be passed in. You need to know how this function works, what goes into it, and if you were the one who wrote the code, it gets intense. So I intentionally want to overwhelm you a little bit with thinking about this, Okay. And I know, again, that you guys have expo been exposed to this. You've written lots of code. You already know. But I just want to make sure we, we think of this in a deep level, okay? One of the big things that you hopefully gain from this class is the ability to, for want of a better way to put it, draw pictures, visualize stuff. That's what sets are for. That's what graphs are for and matrices and... and um, you know, functions and all these little things that we've looked at and drawn together, and and um, it helps us to be able to visualize the data. And so the hope here is that we can we can visualize things. Maybe we draw pictures, we write little pseudo code, and it helps us to sort of bring it all together. And so we're gonna when we look at some of these algorithms. We're gonna see some little bit of a few pictures to help us wrap our head around it, right? But how do we feel about this peanut butter sandwich experiment? So. I'm curious what, let's just quickly read off what you guys have over here on yours. Invent the universe, Invent the universe. nice, step one. Get a knife. Get, knife. Get, ingredients. Get ingredients. Open peanut butter jar and bread bag. Open bread and peanut butter jar, okay. Extract two slices of bread. Extract, I like the choice there, extract two slices of bread. Lay bread slices down next to each other. Okay, place the bread down on the, next to each other on the counter or something. Apply, apply peanut butter and jelly. So Extra you parameter. Find it as a jar is both peanut yes, and jar. but it would not be a peanut butter sandwich. It would be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? Yeah, sure. Which is okay, yeah. right? That's fine. Okay. Yep. So uh, apply PB and J to a single side of each slice of bread. Okay, apply to each side, one side of each bread. And place one side of bread onto the other such that the peanut butter sides face each other. Okay, place the two pieces. Um, Ingredient sides facing each other, ish. Yep, and eat, which that's a whole other method right there. Eating, right? All those are separate methods. Good. All right, and you guys, what'd you get over here? Gather ingredients. Open containers. Toast bread. Toast bread. Nice choice. Spread the peanut butter on the bread with a knife. Call mom. Call mom. What's the call mom all about there? I have no idea. All right. I thought it was, I give up. I need my mom to make me the sandwich. <laughs> That's what I thought. All right. Yes. That's right. So the night, the thing about the toasting there, now that, that's, if you were to add that in, that is maybe when you remove the bread, that's an option. That's a, that's a parameter you pass in, toast or not toast, right? So it can get out of hand and crazy crazy. All right. So hopefully that was a worthwhile experiment to just get us thinking about how deep code can go and how specific you have to be about things. Okay. All right. So let's move out of here. So let's take a look at this idea. This is a pretty common algorithm, either a, a minimum or a maximum, like what's the largest or the smallest number in a, in a string of numbers or an array of numbers. So what roughly does that look like? So look at each number in the array and then see if it's the smallest or largest, whichever way you're going, number that you've looked at so far. So I got a couple steps here that we can kind of look at here. Um, let's say that this is the string, the array that we're looking at. It's just an array of ints, 4, 10, 23, 9, 8, and 11. What I would, and we're, it looks like we're doing a maximum here. 
So I'm going to set maximum equal to 4. Why 4? It's the first thing in the list, and it's just the first thing I saw, and I'm going to assume it's the maximum, right? All right, and then the next thing we do is we compare the next one, compare the max to the next one. If the next one is bigger than max, what do we do? We swap it. We just set max equal to whatever that number is. So in this case, it would be 10. And then if, if it's larger, we change it, as I said, and then rinse and repeat, right? Okay. To the code, which I already have open way over here. Okay. So I got a few programs here that, that are simple, but I just want to take a look at them real quick. And then we'll get to the reason why we're doing all this. Uh, you can't easily increase the size on this. There we go. Okay. So this is a class that has, is called min-max that I wrote and has a max function and a min function. And you can pass into it an array, which is exactly what I did. I passed an array of those exact, are those the same numbers I used? I don't know if they are. I took them off the screen. I don't think they were. No, they're not. But either way, so the next thing I'm going to do is just print out what's the maximum number, what's the minimum number, right? So if I run it, it's going to run max first, and then it's going to print it out, and it's going to run min, right? Simple idea. We're just doing an enhanced for loop. And I start off by initializing the max variable equal to the first element in the array, which is just what we talked about a minute ago, so I'll set it to 10. And then if max is less than that, um, if max, the max variable here is less than whatever element we're looping through, then we're going to change max to equal the value of that element, and then when we're all said and done, we'll return max. Same thing with min. And we'll quickly see that 90 and 3 are the right answers. Now, is that the only way to do that? No, it's not. And I'm not going to ask you a different way, but there's, that's, that's not the only way. Okay? Is this way the best way, the worst way, somewhere in between? I mean, who knows? That's what 2420's life is all about studying which is the best algorithm, right? Okay, so let's just get a little basic foundation here. I want to get our brains back into code for a minute. And so let's take a look at the next thing here. These are some of the most common types of algorithms you're ever going to see, and what do you suppose they are? There's two main things of types of, that are most common types of algorithms. Sorting and searching, yeah. Searches and sorts, okay? And again, this is, why does this stuff matter? Yeah, it's, you, why do we even look at data at all? We look, we're trying to search through it and find something, or we're trying to order it in some specific way, sometimes a little bit of both, depending on what's going on, right? So let's just start off by looking at these two common search algorithms, linear search and binary search, okay? And... We're going to just briefly discuss these. You should have discussed these in 2420, or you will eventually. But let's just take a look at an example here. To the numbers. <laughs> All right, I got a little spreadsheet here. Okay. These are, it's an array, and we're just going to call that the zeroth element. That's the first element, second, all the way down to the 99th element right here. So 100 numbers. I think that's 100. I'm pretty sure it is. But roughly, but it is ranging from 0 to 100. Okay? So, Nate, think of one of those numbers okay. on that list. All right, you ready? Here we go. Is it 61? No. Is it 97? Is it 34? Is it 22? <laughs> is it 31? Okay, you get the idea here, right? All right, so I'll even ask you a second question, which will be useless for the moment but maybe later will come in handy. Is it larger than 31 or smaller than? Smaller than. Okay, but guess what? That has no use to me in this randomly sorted array because I'm just gonna go look through it linearly and look at the next number because I don't know which numbers are smaller than 31. I mean, I as a human know, but I as a program do not, right? So I'm just gonna say, is it 70? And I know it's not because you said it was smaller, but too bad. I have to keep looking. All right, let's try that again. Same number if you want, okay? Well, what number was it? it was two. two, all right, so way the heck down here, unless there's another, no, there's another instance right here. But man, that would have been forever, right? Is it this one, is it this one, is it this one? Okay, oh, there's the one closer still, yeah, okay. All right, so, but that would have taken a while. All right, now, 
let's stick with two. This would have been, I think these are each 20. So that's uh, 40, I don't know, 46, 47, something like that, whatever, I'm not gonna count it. But 46 guesses, right? Okay. Let's say the number's still two. Now, in this ordered array, uh, it would have been nice if I ran through it linear, linearly in this case, because I would have said, is that it? No, is that it? Yep, I'd be done. But we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do what's called a binary search. So the way a binary search works, I'm gonna start in the middle, dead center, which is not the number 50, coincidentally it is, but it's the 50th element because there are 100 elements in the array, right? Or the 49th, you know, if you're counting from zero, right? So I'm gonna start here and ask you, is it the number 50? And you're gonna say, no, it's less than, right? So what did I just do though? I just eliminated all of these as, a, as a, even a possible option. It can't be any of those, right? Next thing I do is I cut it in half again. Is it that or is it less than? And you're going to say it's less than again, right? So I just eliminated all of these, right? Two guesses in and I've already narrowed it down to only 24 possibilities. Even if I went through those 24 one at a time, that's still faster than the linear search would have been a minute ago, right? But we cut it in half again, 12-ish. You say, no, it's less than. So I just eliminate all this. Then I say six and you say, nope, it's less than six. Then I say three and you say, no, it's less than three. And now I'm gonna say two or one, but one or two more guesses and I've got it, right? So that's, I don't know, five or six guesses. It will always be about that many guesses, right? Now, the bigger the list grows, the more you have, but this, this function here, this method, this algorithm is much, much quicker than a linear search. Now, with the linear search, you could get lucky, right? If, if the number you picked was 1, and that was it, or if you, the number you picked was 61, I would have been lucky, my first guess. But I also would have been lucky if the number you picked was 50, right? All right, so hold that thought for just a minute. Oops, back to the PowerPoint here. So let's take a look. What are some observations we can make about these two Algorithms. I got a couple bullet points under each one. What are some thoughts about these that you notice? If you know about big O notation or about uh, how, how effective algorithms are, feel free to speak in those terms. If you know that stuff. If you don't, that's okay. So what's linears? Say it again. Big o of n. Okay. Big O of n. We'll talk about what that means in a second. And then binary, it's, log n. it's big O of log n, right? So what that means, and you're going to learn all about big O notation when you get to um, 2420, but this is dealing with how, how much time it takes <coughs> as the size of the array scales. Well, no matter how big the array is for a linear search, the worst case scenario is it will take length of the array number of times. If the array has got 100 things in it and the number you chose was the very last number in the array, well, it'll take that many guesses to get through it, right, to do a search. Because remember, that is a search we're doing. Binary, it will take half as many guesses each time as we go through. And we call it, that's logarithmic, right? It's the opposite of exponential, okay? All right, so here's a couple things. Number one, the linear array does not need to be sorted, right? But the binary array must be sorted before you can do anything. Ever see why? Okay, if the binary array is not sorted, then I don't know where the, I don't know that this element is less than that element in value because it's not sorted. It has to be sorted, okay? So if I'm gonna run a binary um, operation, a binary search, I have to first sort the algorithm, right? So, your actual speed of a binary search is not exactly log n. It's log n plus however fast your search it, your sort is. Everybody see that? Okay. All right, so what is this O of n and O of log n and all this business? This runs in linear time, right, as I just mentioned. And so it runs on the order of, that's what the O stands for, of n. It's how much time it will take. And it's not a specific 
number of minutes or hours or seconds, but it's just on the order of. It's going to get bigger as the amount of data gets bigger. Whereas in the logarithmic scenario with binary, it's going to be a logarithmic amount of time, and it won't take nearly as much time. It runs much faster. It's much more efficient. Okay, And so we say it runs on the order of log n. All right? So again, we're not going to study big O. This is That's for your 2420 class. But that is just a way of giving a rough notation of which algorithm is more effective. And there's techniques you'll learn later on how to look at the algorithm and see what the what the big O value is, all right? All right, so clearly the logarithm one is faster, right? Assuming we it's already sorted. But why is it so fast? Yeah, every check you're, you're reducing the number of by half, right? Well, there's something that has that's similar that kind of goes in the other other direction. Some of you may have seen this already, so if you've seen this already, you don't get to play. All right. So, here's the question for you. I will either this is all hypothetical. This is not real, but I will either give you one thousand dollars right now, or if you can wait thirty-one days if, till the end of the month. This is October till the end of the month. I will give you the equivalent of a penny doubled every day. So your choices are $1,000 right now or a penny doubled every day. Now, I'm not going to give you a penny today and two pennies tomorrow, but I will give you the equivalent of that. So it starts at one penny today, then tomorrow it will be two pennies, and then the third day it will be four pennies, then eight, then 16. I'll give you the final total at the end of the month, right? So again, those of you who have not seen this before, I don't know if that's anybody in the room. Who has never seen this before? Everybody's seen it? Okay, well, you can all play. So what's, what's your answer so far? Take the pennies or take the thousand? Take the pennies, okay, let's sweeten the deal. I'll give you 10,000 bucks or penny doubled every day. Don't calculate it, don't calculate it, don't calculate it. All right, I'll, I'll tempt you a little more. 100,000. <laughs> well, what if I told you I'd only give it to you on the end of the month? So you either, you either give you the 100,000 on the end of the month or I'll give you the equivalent of all those doublings at the end of the month, the last day of the month. All right, how about a million bucks? Got some people taking the million bytes still hanging in there? You're gonna keep going? All right, I'll give you 10 million. I took the 10 million. You'll take the 10 million? And then uh, invest what we're looking for. <laughs> invest it right now. <laughs> All right, so the truth is if you take the 10 million, you'll lose out on $757,000. Not bad. That was a good gamble, but that is still, that's. Now, it's crazy, right? Let's prove it, though. So here's a calculator. I'm going to put in 0 0.01 times 2, and I hit Enter. That is day 2, right? Day 3, day 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Day 15, you only have 160 bucks, right? Day 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, you're at 1.3 million, 29, 30, this is October, 31 days, 10 million dollars, 10.7 10 million, okay? Why am I showing you that? That's called growing exponentially, right? Well, binary search grows logarithmically, it's, it's logarithmically, it's the opposite basically of growing exponentially. So you saw how fast that number skyrocketed, right? Well, that the opposite of that is how slow the, the, the amount of time will rise when you run a binary search, right? As much as this exponentially grew, your binary search will the opposite of exponentially grow and grow logarithmic, logarithmically, that's hard to say. And so it grows very slowly. It, take, it doesn't, it, it starts off, I mean, think about what an exponential curve looks like. Right? It just goes straight up almost. Well, the logarithmic curve goes almost straight horizontal. Right, There's some curve to it, 
but it's almost straight horizontal. And so this this idea that with the logarithmic growth, this the this thing scales well. If you have a huge list, it scales really well because every pass through it, you shrink it by half. Yes, very good point. So it took us 31 steps to get to 10.7 million, meaning if we were doing binary search, you could do 10.7 million checks in 31 steps. That sounds right. Yep. Okay. Because the first check, I'm going to eliminate 5 million options, right? So I can get 31, 10 million checks isn't quite right, but 10 million pieces of data, right? I can get through 10 million pieces of data. Yeah. All right. So now keep in mind though, with our, our um, binary search, we still have to sort the data. If we don't sort the data, then it's not as efficient. It's, 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 not even efficient at all. You will never find the right number, right? It's, it's worthless. It has to be sorted. So in the case of running a binary search, you have to also sort the list first. Now, there are tons of sorting algorithms out there, and some are better than others. These two are two of the, the worst ones, but they're easy to understand, so we're going to use those to start with. And then again, 2420, you'll spend time studying some more complex ones. You guys will look at insertion sort, but you will not look at bubble sort. The reason I like to talk about bubble sort is because if I never told you that there's a bunch of existing algorithms out there for searching or for sorting, and and I just told you you had to write one, and you never really knew about search algorithms or sorting algorithms, you would probably write a bubble sort. You would just like come up with that on your own. That's pretty easy. In fact, the first time years ago, you know, 100 years ago when I went to college, our my professor said make sort an array of numbers. And I wrote essentially a bubble sort, not knowing that that was a thing, okay? So that's a pretty common way that people think about it. Over the years, people have improved sort, sorting um, algorithms and come up with new ones that are crazy fast and amazing and that are unbelievable. We'll look at a few samples of that in a second. But the idea here is you're constantly trying to improve the speed and efficiency of your algorithm. And so you study what's the worst case scenario which is where we use big O or yeah, big O notation, and then what's the the best case scenario, which is big omega, which I think you guys touch on that a little bit in 2420, and then there's also big theta, which I don't think you get into in 2420. They do cover all three of those in the book if you want to look at that. But my main concern, big O is just sort of a broad stroke. This is roughly what this algorithm is going to be like, right? All right. So let's take a look at the bubble sort of those five numbers. Here's how the bubble sort works. All right. You start off with your first pass, and this, this is actually cut right out of the book here, by the way. So the way a bubble sort works is it goes through the list, and it starts com by comparing the first two numbers in the list, three and two. And if, assuming we're sorting ascending, we're going to end up with one, two, three, four, five when we're done. It looks at three and two and says, oh, three is bigger than two, so I'm going to swap. Right, so it made those comparisons. That's what double arrows mean there in this little scenario. It swapped them. Okay, so still on the first pass through the array, it swapped the two, the three and the two. As you can see, the new list there is what it looks like after the swap. Then it moves and compares the next two numbers, three and four. Notice there's no arrows there, meaning it just compared them. It didn't need to swap. It's done. It moves on to the next phase of the st still the first pass. It compares four and one and realizes, oh, I need to swap because four is bigger than one. And so you end up here. And then it compares four to five, and it sees I don't need to change anything. Also, I'm at the end of the list. And now I have two, three, one, four, five after my first pass. Also, we know that once we're there, we know I never have to look at five again because five has been compared to everything along the way. The, the way I think of this is when... Um, you guys probably can't even relate to this unless you're in your 40s. Um, back in the day when we, I would make compilation cassette tapes, right? And I would take all of my cassette tapes and I'd want to pick the best like 15 or 20 songs that I want to put on one cassette. And so I would list off all the songs and I would compare them to each other. I had 30 songs, but I needed to narrow it down to like 10, right? So I would compare the first two songs with each other and I'd say, okay, is is, you know, You Give Love a Bad Name by Bon Jovi better than Night Songs by Cinderella, 
And I say, no, I like night songs better. So I would sort the list by moving night songs ahead of Bon Jovi, right? And then now I compare night songs to the third thing on the list. Is it better than this song? Eventually, all the best stuff bubbles its way up to the top, and all the worst stuff is on the end. And I just truncate the first five or six or whatever uh, songs, and then those remaining ten or what I've put on my mixtape, right? Now with stuff like Spotify and Apple Play, it's not even a thing anymore. You just make your own playlist, right? And they can be infinitely large, basically, right? But we were limited to like 45 and 60 minute cassette tapes, man. Oh, the joys of living in the 80s. All right, anyway, so this is the same idea as that, though. If you've ever done something like that, it's the same basic idea. That five was already at the end there, but look at what happened to that four. It bubbled its way through each part of the first pass to the end of the list, right? So now we move on to the second pass. We just did one iteration through that array, okay? Now our second pass, the new array looks like two, three, one, four, five, and five we know is done. Now we compare two and three, and we realize, nope, three is where it needs to be as far as it goes with two. But now I'm gonna compare it to one, and I realize I gotta swap. And then I now compare three and four, and there's no comparison, no swap needed. And so now this list is done, and we're at two, one, three, four, five, and four and five are locked in, right? So now our third pass looks like this. We compare one and two, and we see that we do need to swap. So we end up with one, two, three, four. Now, as humans, we can look here and go, oh, it's done. But the computer doesn't know that, right? The computer doesn't know. It still has to compare two and three. It doesn't need to bother with four and five because we've already somehow in our code marked that those are done, right? So now we get to the fourth pass, where it's starting off with one, two, three, four, and five, already in order, and we know we're not supposed to worry about three, four, and five anymore because they've made it through the cycles. We just look at one and two, no swap is needed, okay? And we don't have to go any further because those other three we already know are done. And that's, that's basically it. Now there's a little key there if you want that, that denotes what those numbers are, okay? So this is how bubble sort works. And again, this is, I think most of us would have thought of this, and that, that what inspired my, my original, in air quotes, bubble sort in my class was that very thing with my, my playlist, right? All right. The way you put these things together is you will um, keep a counter, what we call a swap counter, and if you make one entire pass through the array, and never increment the swap counter. In other words, every time you swap two numbers, you're gonna increment that variable. If you make it through an entire pass of the array and you don't swap, that means it's in order. That's how you know it's in order. And we're gonna look at some code in a second. Any questions about the bubble sort before we look at the insertion sort? Yeah, that, that when it, so the question was, when it compares one and two, is, that, is it done? And the answer is yes. So what's happening there Along the way, we've kept track of how far deep into the array we need to look. And we know, because of the way our code's written, that I don't need to look at the, the zero, 01, the second element, which is the number three, right? The, the, if we count by zeros. So in other words, as along the way, when I got done with the first pass, I now have recorded somewhere in my algorithm, no longer do I need to look at the zero, 01, 2, 3, fourth value. And then when he got done with the, the second pass, I now am aware that I no longer need to look at the third and fourth value. And when I got done with the third pass, I now am aware I don't need to look at the second, third, and fourth value. And so when I finish the fourth pass, which I, I didn't need to even go any further because I've already decided those I don't have to look at anymore. All that's left is to look at the remaining elements zero and one, it's the only two in there. And if I look at them and I don't swap them, then that tells me, oh, I don't need to swap them, they're already where they need to be. And also, even if I did need to swap them, didn't matter, I'd swap them, but three, four, and five are already done because we've kept track of that the whole way through. All right? does that help? All right, other questions? Yeah, uh, what is the big O notation for this algorithm? In squared, because you have an inner loop, right? The question was, what's the big O notation on this? And it's or, uh, order of N squared. Because you're gonna have one loop that loops through the array and then an inner loop that's gonna loop through it again with all the comparisons. Yeah, so it'll end up being N squared. Also, it turns out, and oops, moving to the next slide. 
insertion sort is also, I think it still comes out n squared as well. I'm pretty sure it does. So insertion sort is a whole different uh, take on things though. It's a, it's a different idea. So the way this works is we just look through the array and we assume that that element is sorted. We just say the first thing I look at is sorted. Kind of like our min-max thing. We just assume the first element is the minimum or is the maximum. Same idea here. So we assume that that's sorted. Then on the next pass through, we, we look at the next number, which would be in this case, the four. And we compare it to the sorted portion of the array. And what do we do? If it's, if it's not sorted, we just move the five over, basically swap. But we move the five over and put the four in front of it, okay? Next up, we look at this number, and we're gonna compare it to this. As long as it's bigger than that, then we know it's good, because we know everything to the left is already sorted, right? So the next piece isn't gonna do anything, right? When I go here, it's still gonna be four, five, six. But then we're gonna look at three, and we're gonna see, oh, it's less than six, and then we're gonna go, okay, well, let's keep looking. Don't do anything yet. Let's look at the next number. It's less than that, well, keep looking less than that and we know there's nothing else so let's sort of lift the three out of there and scooch the four five and six over and then put the three at the beginning right that's just pseudo code english right that's not you know you have to write the code to do that but when you're done you'll end up with that three automatically at the beginning there and then the last one we'll look at the seven and it'll look and see if it's bigger than that and it is and so we're done and we know it's the last element it's the nth minus one element and it's bigger than the nth minus two element, so we're done. Okay, that's an insertion sort. And I'm pretty sure that's still n squared. I, I, we'll look at the code in a second, we'll be able to see. Okay, questions about how that works? <laughs> to the code. Let's start with the bubble sort here. Uh, this bubble sort looks bigger than it, than it really is because I've added a few little extra lines for printing stuff out and everything, All right? So we can see each pass. But here's the array we're running through it right here. These six numbers or whatever. And here is, this is just the main method right here. This is the actual code for it though. There's an outer loop that just loops through the array and then ignore all this printing stuff. There's an inner loop that's in, looping through the array and each time it loops through the array, it goes through less of the elements in the array, right? But in a worst case scenario, if this array were backwards, like sorted backwards, you'd have to go n squared number of times. You have to loop through the array twice for every element in there, okay? But this, this is really the bulk of the code right there. These are just some printing stuff here. That's really it right there. If, if we need to swap, we swap. If we don't, we don't, okay? So let's run it. And starting with the unsorted array here, and then this uh, pass number one, again, you can see this is looking here, this is our starting point, okay? And pass number one compared 64 to 34, and it made a swap right there. And the next thing it did is it compared 64 to 25, and it made a swap again, getting us to this position here. And now that 64 is compared to the 12, and it swaps, and you end up with this next one. Then we compare the 64 to the 22, again it swaps. Then it compares the 64 to the 11, swaps again, and that's it. But you see that little progress there, how it's just moving its way along to the end? And so by the time we're done with this first pass, this is the new array. And I'm not going to walk through every piece of it, but again, what happens here, it's going to compare those first two numbers right there, and we see that it needed to swap. And then now that it's, the next thing you'll do is compare those two, and now it swaps and 34 is here, and it compares those two, and it keeps bubbling its way up to the top, and by the end of the third pass, 34 is all the way in place, by, or the second pass. By the end of the third pass, 25 is in place, right here. In the fourth pass, 22 is in place. In the fifth pass, 12 and also 11 are in place. And during the sixth path, the sixth pass, it looked at 11 and 12. It knew that those were already sorted. It looked at 11 and 12 and said, oh, I don't need to swap, so there's not, we're not even gonna do a sixth pass sixth pass and we end up with that final array there okay that's the bubble sort insertion sort again this is printing stuff here okay 
But the main, this is, again, this is just the, the main method here that's calling all this stuff. But the actual function is just this part right here. It's not much. Okay. All right. So let's run it. And you can see the unsorted array, 12, 11, 13, 5, 6. And we assume that 12 is, the, is sorted. And then the next thing we did was compared 11 to 12, and we realized, oh, we got to scoot that over. So we scooted 12 forward. And then we looked at 13. We don't need to look at 12 again. We just compare 13 to 12. And we realized 13 is where it needs to be. Then we looked at 5, and we realized, hey, wait a minute. 5 is not where it needs to be. So it scooches its way all the way down. You get this. Then we compare 6, and it works its way down and squeezes in right there. And you get this. Okay. My printouts are a little wonky. There's a few things missing in the printouts, but the steps are still all there. Okay. So those are two simple sorts. That I think either of those you would be an easy one if I said, hey, write your own, write a sort. You could probably easily come up with either of those. All right. So now the art is figure out what the heck is the most efficient, what's the fastest sort or the fastest search. Okay. So we're going to pull up a few things here on YouTube to kind of look at to give you a sense of some of the stuff. All right, what we're looking at here, we're going to run it in just a second. But this is a visual representation of the bubble sort, and I've slowed the speed way down to 0.25 speed. I'll speed it up so that it doesn't take us 10 hours to get through a one-minute video. But I want you to see it slowly and try to follow what's happening. But the idea of what we're looking for is this is going to be sorting ascending. So this guy right here, this big, tall, red one, you're going to see it's going to keep swapping with everybody along the way. And you'll just see it'll just sort of work its way up to the top probably until it gets here. I think this guy is taller. But then this guy, it'll be like a tag team. It hits that big guy, and this guy scoots all the way over. It'll keep switching all the way over, right? So let's play it. You see that's how it switched? It works its way all the way to the top and at the end. As you watch along the way, let's pause it in just a second right here. Okay, this guy right here where my mouse is, he is going to bump up against this guy. This guy is going to continue on, bump up against this guy, knock this guy forward, this guy forward, and this guy is going to make it all the rest of the way. Okay? I'm going to keep my mouse right here. And when it gets there, you'll see this guy move. See it? There he goes, all the way to the end. Okay, and I'll turn up the volume or the speed here. But you can see as it starts piling up, and notice it doesn't, the last few that are sorted, it doesn't count those. Because once they're sorted, they're sorted. And it gets faster and faster as it has to go through less and less of the array. All right, so I stopped there because I want to show you these numbers at the top here. 4,950 comparisons, 14,000 array accesses, and I believe, let's look in the comments, it tells you how many elements this represents. Um, it's sorting 1,100 numbers, right? So it's an array of 1,100 in length, and it had to compare almost five times the length of the actual array, that many times. It had to access the array way more than that, 14,000 times, right? By the way, this, this, the guy who creates these or the team or whoever that creates these, they have a whole algorithm that figures out the, the appropriate sound based on what you're looking at. So that's the whole thing that they built in. That if you go to their website, it talks about that. This right here, panthema.net. All right, so let's look at um, insertion sort visualization here and I'll try to stop it before it gets going let's go back and slow it way down for just a moment 
Now remember what's happening with the insertion sort. It starts off assuming the thing on the left is sorted. So it's assuming right now that this red thing is sorted. The moment it sees that green thing, it's going to realize, oh, no, the green thing's got to scooch over. And so the green thing is going to scooch over to here. Then this white one right here where my mouse is, it's going to go, oh, well, I'm smaller than all these, so I need to scooch over. And this guy's going to go, well, I'm smaller than a couple, and it's going to scooch over, and so on down the line. But you'll see that it starts sorting from left to right rather than bubbling all the way up to the top. And you can see sometimes, let's right here, when it gets to this little guy, you're going to watch this little guy right here work its way all the way backwards to the beginning. So that is being compared with each one and being backed up all the way to the beginning. This music reminds me of the Zeldas, Zelda 1980s Zelda. Okay, let's speed it back to normal now. We'll go 1.25. Anybody play the old Zelda from the 80s? Doesn't it sound like that? <laughs> well, it'll start happening though. This You'll see this seems to be a little bit slower and it doesn't have that buildup of speed like a bubble sort does. Because this guy way over here, he's gonna have to work his way all the way back. Right, this little guy here is gonna have to work his way all the way back. Let's speed it up here. Can you see it happening? You can see the little flash in the middle of the smaller one working its way down. Double speed. Let's see if I can catch it at the very end. I was thinking, pew, pew. All right, look at the number of comparisons. 2,600 comparisons, how much was the last one? 4,900, right? 7,800 array accesses versus 14,000 array accesses, right? So this one has less hits to the, the actual array, and so maybe it's more efficient, but didn't it seem a little bit slower, right? It's still 1,100 records, all these are 1,100 records, okay? So this is where using big O notation and and analysis of algorithms, which is a lot of stuff in the book about this, and your entire 2420 curriculum is all about that one thing, analyzing algorithms, right? So you have to figure out which one's the most effective. Now, just for fun, I'm going to show you a couple other ones that we don't really talk about in this class, but it's just fun to see. So, like the merge sort. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> merge sort visualization. Now the merge sort, the way this works is it's, it takes the whole array and splits it into, it cuts the array in half and makes two arrays, and then cuts those in half and makes two arrays, and it keeps doing that until you're left with literally nothing but every element in its own array. So it makes a whole bunch of arrays. So if I had 100 elements, when I'd start off with 100, with the, the elements, 100 elements in my array, and then halfway through the merge sort, I'd end up having 100 separate arrays that have one element in each, right? And because it's only one element, it's sorted, right? Then you start taking those arrays and you start building an array of two, and then an array of four, and then an array of eight, and each time you grab the lowest numbers from those other arrays and start building it, right? So I'm not gonna go into the details. If you wanna watch this video right here, right above it, it'll show you how that works. But you can see the visualization of it. We'll just speed it up and get to the end. But you can see how it split those arrays, right? It's splitting them into two, and then it merges them together, and then it merges those two together, right? Now you got the last two, it's gonna merge it back into one big one. Five hundred comparisons and eighteen hundred accesses, right? So this one's more efficient, but it depends on a lot of things. Sometimes it depends on if you have the arrays already sorted, partially sorted, a whole bunch of different things that go into the consideration of it, right? And then there's going to be one more here, which is the radix 
sort visualization. Is that the one I want? I think that's the one. Yeah, this is this thing is like magic. Watch this. Bam. Look how many comparisons. Zero. Look how many array accesses. 800. This is a crazy algorithm, okay? They don't teach that algorithm in 2420 either. I think they should. It's a crazy cool algorithm. So we're not going to get into it, but if you want to study it, that's the fun one to look at, the radix sort visualization. And here's a good resource for you. Geeksforgeeks.org. And you can search, uh, just go to their search box up here, which is Google-based, but um, pick an algorithm, right? The radix, let's, yeah, we'll do the radix sort. And right here, Geeks for Geeks. And down here, it'll show you C++ and C code, Java code, Python, C Sharp, PHP. That's the actual function. Here's a visualization of how it works. And they're usually, yeah, it's like a one minute video that shows you how it works. And then um, I think this is a thing you can walk through, yeah, one piece at a time that shows you where you can kind of walk through it and try to figure it out yourself. Anyway, really cool site for learning about algorithms and how they function. There's a ton of good stuff on there, but geeksforgeeks.org. And if you just search geeks for geeks and, and the name of some algorithm you want, you'll, you'll find it on here. It's pretty cool. All right, how do we feel overall? Just kind of big picture. The, the main thing I'm trying to get across here is this. When it comes to algorithms, there are dozens and dozens of search algorithms and sorting algorithms. And which one's more efficient depends on what you're doing, what kind of data you have, how it's already arranged, what you already know about it, what you don't know about it, all kinds of different things. And some of them require companionships, right? Like the binary search has to also be sorted first. So anytime you're going to run a binary search, you also have to run some sort of sorting algorithm. Now, Java has built in a binary search class or method in the search um, class. I'm not sure, but they have a binary search somewhere in there. They, have, they just have a search, and behind the scenes, I think it uses binary search. What's the class that you guys use for searching through an array? You guys use it before? This collections. That's in the collections. Yeah. And it's just called dot .search, right? Collections.search or whatever dot, dot .search. But that, at the moment, it, it uses whatever, binary or whatever search it, it does. Over the years, it's been different ones, and they change it. That's the beauty of encapsulation, right? You don't have to think about what's the code behind it. You just pass in the parameters that the search thing says, which is just an array, basically. And then it runs what they feel is the most efficient algorithm of the day, right? And I, by the day, I mean of the time, right? Okay, anyway, I like to build them myself just for the practice and make sure I understand them. And if this were 2420, you'd be building all these algorithms. Okay, any questions about any of that stuff? We good? All right, so back here. Let's talk about greedy algorithms, all right? Greedy alg algorithms are interesting. Greedy algorithms, that's a tricky thing to say. What they do is they take the most efficient step our most efficient path at each step without regard to the big picture. So here's an example. You guys seen those uh, grocery store things where you, I think Smith's has these, Harmon's has them, where you pay with cash and then the machine automatically gives you your change. The clerk doesn't hand it to you, you just have the little machine that counts it out. So we're gonna make change using an algorithm that we're gonna use a machine that has an algorithm that is designed to give you the least amount of coins back possible, right? So we're gonna get 31 cents change. So an algorithm is, is to calculate, is meant to calculate the change of 31 cents using the least amount of coins. Well, if this were a greedy algorithm, here's what it would do. It would start off with 31 cents, knowing it's supposed to get that, and it would say, okay, the, these are the coins I have to choose from, so I'm gonna, it starts here, this is the first spot on its path, and it goes, okay, I got one quarter, that's 25 cents. Is that 31? Nope, okay, I'll add a second quarter. Is that 31? No, it's 50, it's too much, so I'm gonna put one quarter back. 
right? So I got one quarter. Now, what's 31 minus 25? Six. So it's going to go to the dimes and go, okay, I'm going to add one dime here. And I'm going to find out, oh, that's too much. So I'm going to put the dime back. Then it's going to add a nickel. Okay, that's good. 25 plus 5 is 30. All right, now I'm going to add one more because it's still less than 31. I'm going to add another nickel. Now I'm at 40, and it's like, ah, crap, that's too many. So it puts one back. So now we've decided so far to choose one quarter, one nickel, and now it's going to add one penny, and it realizes, hey, that's 31. I'm done. Each step along the way, it shows the least amount of coins at that step. Not necessarily the least amount of coins that it could be done with. In this case, coincidentally, yes, this is the least amount of coins to give you 31 cents, three coins. There's no other way that's less coins to give you 31 if you're using these four American coins, right? All right. But what happens if the drawer is out of nickels, right? They ran out of nickels or whatever. Maybe it's nickel cade, right? So it goes along for the ride and it looks at the first stop, does the same thing, grabs a quarter, tries to grab a second one, but realizes that's too many, so it stops. Then next up, it goes and tries to grab a dime. What happens there? The dime's too much, right? So we have 25 cents. Okay, so it doesn't keep the dime, or we have 35, which is too much. So what's it do now? It goes to the pennies. It's gonna grab one penny, that's 26. Another penny, that's 27, 28, 29. So how many pennies total? Six, so how many coins total? Seven. Is that the most efficient number of coins that you could do if giving 31 cents with those three denominations? It's not, what's the most efficient? Yeah, four coins, right? Three dimes and a penny, right? But this is a greedy algorithm. It takes the best thing right now. That's what we call it greedy. It's like, I want it now. This is what I get now, okay? We, uh, you don't really talk about these. Who's been in 2420? You guys don't really cover greedy algorithms in there, right? No? So these are important to understand because they can be useful, but it depends on what you're doing. So here's an example. You guys remember these kind of pictures, 2420? Okay, this is a graph, right? And just some brief vocabulary here. These are called nodes or vertices, a vertex and a node. So we have five nodes, A, B, C, D, and E. These are called edges, right? The line here, it's hard to draw on that, but here, better said. That is an edge, right? A, it's a line between two nodes. And then these, this particular graph is what's called a weighted graph, right? A weighted graph means that this has some value, in this case, three. Three what? Well, maybe this is five cities and the lines represent highways between the cities or roads between the cities and it, it's three miles or three thousand miles or three hundred miles but it's the distance of the road right okay or maybe it's the length of cable between the admin building and the business building and the science building and the institute building right maybe it's that okay but it's some weighted value the, the Actual value, what it represents doesn't really matter, but it's some weighted value, okay? And the last thing, this is what's known as an undirected graph, right? A digraph, which we talked about briefly when we looked at chapter 9.3 with representing matrices or representing relations, digraph would have an arrow on it, right? It's, it has a direction. When there's no direction on it, then it means it goes both ways. So like a highway would go both ways between city A and city B. All right. So with all that said, our goal, and I went too far. You guys saw it there. Maybe I didn't. Yeah, I guess I revealed the answer inadvertently right there. But here's the question. To try not to look at those purple numbers. Just look at the graph, right? Don't, don't be distracted by the man behind the curtain there, all right? So what is the, if a greedy algorithm wanted to get from A to D, what direction would it go? Well, here's what would happen. It would start here, and it's like, okay, I can go this way, or I can go this way. Well, it's going to go this way because that's it's less. I'm supposed to use the least amount of miles, right? 
That's my, my job, the least amount of miles. Right, so I'm trying to figure out how many feet of cable, what's the most efficient way to get cable wired to the, the D building, let's say. All right, so now it's going here. So it gets to B, and then at B it has a decision to make, right? It's either going to go down this path or go down that path. Which way is it going to go? B to C. Then when I'm at B, or when I'm at C, it has only one way it can go, which goes 3, 1, 4. That's 8, right? But what's the most efficient path? A through E through D, right? What's going on here? There we go. So the most efficient path would be go from A to E, then from E to D. That's only five dollars or five miles or five feet or five whatevers, right? So in this case, a greedy algorithm might be a bad thing because it looks at what's the best decision at the moment, right? And again, there are scenarios where this can be useful, but in this particular case, like the thing with the coins is not the end of the world if the user gets, you know, six pennies, it's not the end of the world, okay? But there are algorithms that you can design that will take the most efficient path based on the actual total number, right? And so there are alg algorithms that can find the A to E to D path. And you'll study these kind of things and, and you look at some famous algorithms and some, some path finding algorithms in 2420. But notice what I had to do here to figure this out. I had to draw a picture, right? I had to figure this out. What I've done in the past to students is I would, without drawing this picture, I would say to them out loud, okay, you have five points, A, B, C, D, and E, and then the distance between A and B is three, the distance between A and E is four, and I'd throw out all these numbers, and then I'd ask you to calculate the best path. And the first thing everybody does is they draw a picture like this. Right? Because that's the way our brains work as humans. That's why we have Venn diagrams. So we can draw things and understand. That's why we have sets and that's why we have little pictures and little animations and things we draw and try to figure out. Okay? To help us map things out. When we get into, in the future, we're going to dive into chapter, I think it's 10 or 11 about graphs. One of those two. We'll talk more about graphs and some graph theory, some basic ideas there. But big picture here. A greedy algorithm in this scenario would probably be bad, right? We'd lose some money here. We'd lose however much those extra couple feet cost us, a couple miles, okay? Questions about this? Feeling okay?